everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Let me say to the Hispanic ministry, buenos dias. Good to see you today. I also want to say good morning to all of you who are sitting on the beach watching online. We're glad you're here, and we hate you, right? So uh, just uh, by virtue of the crowd, there's some folks that took an early vacation day. But I'm glad you guys are all here as we uh, jump in. You can be turning in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8 is where we're going to uh, kind of walk today, but a couple of things I got to let you know about before we, uh, before we jump in. The first is uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. We are less than a month away. This is a massive outreach for our church and an important week. Uh, you got to be excited because we have nearly 500 kids already registered for VBS uh, with a month to go. So that's really incredible. And, and what, you know what I'm going to say next, right? Um, we need servants to come and minister to all these kids in our Creek Kids Ministry and our Creek Special Needs uh, Ministry. And so you go to richlandcreek.com slash VBS and there you can sign up to be a helper. We need folks just kind of behind the scenes. We need folks teaching and serving with the kids, all the above. And so go and it will, it will not fail to be a blessing to you to be a part of an incredible week, July 24th through the 27th. And I did want to say, I, I talked to Pastor Mike this week and he did remind me that while we want to minister to as many kids as possible, we want to have a lot of space available, there are some rooms and some ages that are filling up. And so if you haven't registered your kids or your grandkids or you know, maybe you have a, a neighbor or something you want to invite, go ahead and tell them now go ahead and register now for VBS if you would like to be a part of it uh, because those spaces are, uh, are filling up. Uh, next thing, you've heard me talk about this a good bit, Pastor Mike's talked about it as well, but grow groups are coming this fall to Richland Creek. Grow groups are a new discipleship ministry of the church that will begin this fall, an opportunity in smaller groups to learn and grow in, uh, in close relationship and accountability with other believers. Really excited about this opportunity. Mainly wanted to bring it up, there's more info in your bulletin, but I mainly wanted to bring it up because there's an info meeting this afternoon. It's just kind of a general information. Anyone's invited from 4 to 6 p.m. and backstage. Uh, I'll be walking through the basics of what grow groups are, especially if you're possibly interested in facilitating a grow group. You want to be there, uh, but come and, and just be a part. There's no obligation if you come to the meeting. It's just going to be informational. Uh, come and be a part of that this afternoon from 4 to 6 in, in backstage. Um, and, uh, and then let me also want to take a minute and, uh, and kind of recognize, we have some special uh, guests, well not kind of not guests, uh, uh, folks that have been here a while. Trey and Laura Wells are uh, a couple of our mission partners. Trey is a, uh, with their two sons, James and John. Trey's an Air Force chaplain, uh, used to be a part of Richland Creek uh, several years ago and for the last few years has been ministering and serving in the Netherlands where he was stationed. And uh, he and his family, he's recently been uh, re assigned to be stationed here in South Carolina, and so they've recently come back to the States, and so they're visiting with us here today. So I just want to ask uh, the Wells family, Trey and Laura and James and John, if they would stand and let us recognize them. Where are you guys? Uh, there we go. Thank you so much for being here. Really grateful for, uh, for your service to the Lord and just, just the, the ministry you have. And we're going to keep praying for you as you keep serving the Lord in, uh, in South Carolina and ministering to our troops. And then the last thing is just to let you know, Pastor Mike will be back uh, next week. He sends his greetings. Uh, he'll be back next week. And we're going to pick back up in our sermon series in Galatians, Free in Christ, uh, in Galatians chapter 5. So you want to be back here to, uh, to hear that. All right. So with all that said, will you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word? We're going to read Psalm 8 uh, together. You read together. You read as I uh, read aloud and just let the word minister to us and then talk about how we can glorify the Lord in it. It says, to the choir master as a superscription, according to the Gitteth, a Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, 
the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as your, as your people, we are gathered here in your majestic name to declare your praise and your glory, yes, to the ends of the earth, but also and especially here this morning as you are here in our midst. We ask you, Lord, as we listen, humble us in our hearts, prepare us to receive your word with all joy and acceptance. And we pray all these things in the name of your matchless and exalted Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you are firstborn, oldest child in the family? Uh, we got a few, right? How many of you are not the firstborn, but had an older sibling who regularly reminded you that they were the firstborn? All right, a little bit of both. I am the firstborn in my family. I have a younger sister and a younger brother, and we get along fine. But I do have to admit, as I recollect instances from my childhood, I was prone to exerting my oldest child status. Right? I, when mom and dad weren't around, I was in charge. That's the way things should be, right? I got to be the boss, right? Now, you can imagine if you probably had similar situations with your siblings. Uh, my sister, especially, she's three years younger than I am, took some umbrage with my leadership. And uh, some of you probably can still hear the voice. If you're an you're um, older sibling, you can still hear the voice of your younger brother or sister. You're not the boss of me, right? Um, one of the reasons I probably loved to assert my position as the firstborn was an instinct that I think all of us possess in greater or lesser measure, and that's this. We like to be big fish in a small pond, right? We, um, we like to control, to have authority over our little corner of the universe, even though we know in our minds that our control, our authority, there's so many things outside of it, right? Right? Now, why are we like this? Why, why, do I, why did I revel in my firstbornness? Why do we like to be kings and queens of our little castles, right? I think because this control, really often, this control that we like to assert, it gives our kind of our lives meaning and order and peace in the midst of a, a chaotic and sometimes discouraging world filled with heartache. The world is just so big. And I, we are so small that if we don't assert our control over our little corner, when we can, how we can, then we risk feeling irrelevant and lost. Right? So if that's you, if you struggle with control, and I think this all of us do at certain times, right? this morning I have both good news and bad news. So let me do the bad news first. Right? The bad news is that your control over your little corner of the world, your life, your job, your family, what, your house, whatever it is, is fleeting and momentary at best and a complete illusion at worst. Right? That's the bad news. But there's good news. And the good news is this. The good news is there is someone who is con in control of everything that is. And the good news is that he created everything and is more wonderful than you can imagine, and he loves you. Right? So his authority and his grace are the subject of this psalm that we read this morning, and they are our only hope. Here's the, here's the main idea I'd like us to recall as we walk through Psalm 8 this morning. Our main idea is that God's majesty gives our lives meaning. God's majesty gives our lives meaning. If, if I had to kind of put 
briefly what my main hope for you is this morning. Uh, it, it is, my hope is that as you finish walking through this psalm with me, that you would think really big, grand, and wonderful thoughts about God in your heart and in your life. I have no idea what kind of application that might make for you, what obedience you would have to exert in relation to that, but my hope is that you would leave thinking much of God and how wonderful he is. If, if, if we can do that, that would be it. Another way of putting this main idea, right, that God's lives gives our, God's mean, majesty gives our lives meaning, another way of putting that is that we actually, as people, we find our purpose in gazing at and glorifying and praising God's beauty, his strength, his majesty, as we'll see put. Now, if we, as we read Psalm 8, as you may have noticed, if, if we were just counting verses, then the theme of Psalm 8 is the description of man and his place in the created order. That actually begins there in verse 4 and goes all the way almost to the, to the end, right? It's this description of man. But in reality, this psalm, it's written by David, uh, it says here, is actually much bigger than just us. And I want to give us that big vision of what David is doing in this psalm. Author Derek Kidner writes this. I thought he put it well. He says, this psalm is an unsurpassed example of what a hymn should be celebrating as it does the glory and grace of God, rehearsing who he is and what he has done, and relating us in our world to him, all with a, a masterly economy of words and in a spirit of mingled joy and awe. I thought that was well put, right? The range of David's poetry is pretty breathtaking as, as we walk through this, right? We're gonna, we're gonna begin at the very beginning, right, with God creating the universe. We're going to travel all the way through time and space and end at the very end of human history and the full exaltation of our Savior, Jesus. And as we travel this breadth of all of time and space, we're going to see the highest of the heights in heaven and the smallest, most intimate setting of a baby's first cry, all within the space of nine verses. So we're going to see in this psalm a description of man, but the psalm's most enduring theme is the greatness of God and our place in the universe as determined by him. And I think David also realizes that, that God's majesty over all things, his control, his creation, is all part of his grace to us. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see four ways, four ways that God manifests or shows his majesty as grace in our lives. Let's start with verse 1 in the very first way that God does this. God's majesty, we're going to see, in the grace of his own glory. God's majesty in the grace of his own glory. Put your eyes back on verses 1 and 2 one more time. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Now, as you, as you probably noticed, hopefully noticed, one of the most striking features of Psalm 8 right off the bat is that the first and last line of this psalm are the same. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is a tip. David wants us to pay attention to this line, and he wants us to interpret the entire psalm in light of it. Let me point out a couple of things just that we kind of see right off the bat. The first is that David celebrates God's name. You see it right there in verse 1. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name. Now that phrase that begins, O Lord, our Lord, you pay attention to your Bible. What you might see there is that while we see the word Lord repeated twice, one of them you probably have in small caps and the other one is just in regular type. Do you see that? Well, that's because even though that in English it's translated Lord, our Lord, those are actually two different Hebrew words. And so directly transliterated, it would say, O Yahweh, or Jehovah, our Adonai. Let's talk about that for just a minute and why that's important. Yahweh, or Jehovah, was God's covenant name. Was the, it was the Jews' covenant name for God that God gave himself 
He gave it to Moses at the beginning of the Exodus narrative, right? It speaks, the, it, it directly kind of translated, it would translate to I am. It speaks to God's self-existence, to the fact that there is nothing else in all of the universe like God. We're going to talk about that in a, in a few moments more. Adonai, translated Lord, that's, that's the, uh, Jehovah, Yahweh is the one in, in all caps in your, uh, in your Bible. Anytime you see the word Lord in all caps, it's the occurrence of God's covenant name, Yahweh or Jehovah. When you see small caps or just regular type, it's Adonai or Lord, and that's a title that, sim- that's a title that simply means master or sovereign or ruler. Right? And so this is God's name. It is majestic, David says. And majesty is God's obvious power and strength. His kind of self-evident awesomeness, if I could put it that way. God doesn't just do majestic things. He is in and of himself majestic. And the fact that his name is majestic means it speaks to his very being. We use the word majesty sometimes to refer to Human kings, not as much in today's world because we don't have as many kings around, but, but historically that's what we would do. And, you know, but when we say to a human king, your majesty, we're really describing them relative kind of, kind of their place in society, right? Relative their authority relative to other human beings. But if, if that authority or that position was gone, we probably wouldn't call them your majesty anymore. For example, if, if King Charles of England... Right? That's the, the only king I know of. I'm sure there's more, but he's the one that, that comes to my mind. If he were to, to step down or abdicate his throne so that he's not a king anymore, he's not royal anymore, he would no longer be your majesty. He would just be Chuck, formerly your majesty, right? So, and, if you're, and again, I said this the first hour, if you're British and I just offended you, I am really sorry. I don't, I'm American. I don't stand on, on ceremony. But the point is, that, 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 that majesty, it, he has it relative to his position. God's majesty, on the other hand, is attached to his name because it's attached to who he is. He is, in a word, if I can use the word, it's intrinsic. That is, it's just who God is. God's name is majestic. His name cannot change, and so his majesty can never change. Majesty is who he is no matter what. And the second thing to notice, so we see this majesty like intrinsic to who God is, it's a part of his name, but we also see how he displays his majesty, how he shows his majesty to us. So he has majesty that he has in and of himself, completely apart from us, but he also displays this majesty to us, and he does it in a couple of ways. He does it first, the psalmist says he sets his glory, if you'll notice there, above the heavens. You see that in verse 1? So his glory is pervasive. It's everywhere. God's name is majestic in all the earth. His glory is set above the heavens. It's also transcendent, right? What does that mean? That means it transcends the created order. Um, if you think about when, when David says, uh, you're, you're set your glory above the heavens, think of heavens as like as high as you can go, right? Heavens are the sky, space, to us human beings, there's nothing above that. We can't, we can't, you can't get higher than the heavens. There is no higher than the heavens. It's simply the highest there is. And so by David saying, you've set your glory above the heavens, what he's communicating is God's glory is not dependent on the heavens. It simply goes past them and is reflected in them. Um, it, when we say that, we are invited. Here's what David's doing. He's inviting us to lift our eyes, to look up, quite literally look up, to see God's immensity, to understand that his glory transcends the created order, even while all of the creation reflects his glory. When we look at the heavens and the earth, we appreciate them, right? We enjoy them. What we don't do is worship them. Amen? Their glory is a reflective glory. That is, it points us back to God's greater glory. And so God has manifested his majesty by putting his glory above the heavens, above everything that is, and reflected in the creation order so we can see him in it. But there's another incredible way, and this is the one that that kind of stands out and is kind of almost shocking to us. The second way that God has manifested this majesty, and that's according to verse 2, in the cries of children and infants. 
Put your eyes on that for a second. It says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength or a stronghold. You might have it translated a stronghold because of your foes. The words there for baby and translated baby and infant in the ESV could mean everything from a, a newborn to a toddler to an elementary age child. So anybody of that kind of young age. Let me read to you a couple of comments that I really found helpful as I studied this and, and really in some cases struggled to get my mind around the immense truth that David is giving us here. The author David Gunderson says, God is praised in the brilliance of the heavens and in the babbling of infants. He loves to draw this praise from the smallest, weakest, most inarticulate mouths. David Howard, author and scholar, says, it's certainly strange imagery to say that children's words build a stronghold that deters God's enemies, yet that is precisely what the passage says. God, excuse me, God takes these babblings and turns them into a stronghold that silences his enemies in their rebellion against him. It shows that God, listen to this, this is really key, it shows that God takes the weakest of all things and makes something great and strong from it. So we can see God in the immensity and strength of all creation as well as in the weakness and vulnerability of a child. Charles Spurgeon said that he who delights in the song of angels is pleased to honor himself in the eyes of his enemies by the praise of little children. So our enemy, Satan, would, Satan would have us look at a small child and be reminded of our vulnerability, right? of our fragility. And that's true, both those things are true. But then he would want us to despair of our place in the world, our smallness, our weakness. God, on the other hand, wants us to hear the cries of a child and remember that our weakness is his strength. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, But what God chose, what is foolish in the world, to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. I think this point is uh, perhaps established and underlined by, uh, by a story about a, um, a, a theologian named uh, Karl Barth. Karl Barth, um, I wouldn't recommend reading, uh, recommended reading. Um, he's a German theologian, probably the greatest well-known theologian of the 20th century. Very dense, hard to read, um, but he, uh, he did talk about the Bible a lot. And, and, uh, but he, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot, a lot. And so he wrote his, his main work, uh, the hundreds of the hundreds of books he wrote, his, he wrote he ma his main work is a 13-volume systematic theology called Church Dogmatics. Again, don't buy it on Amazon or anything like that. But I only say that to you because it's important for the story I'm about to tell. So in the early 1960s, Bart uh, traveled to the United States. He only came to the United States once in his life. Um, and he participated in, the, in a Q&A with some students. And one of the students asked him a question that everybody else thought was stupid. Uh, could you, Dr. Bart, summarize your entire life's work in a few words? And of course, the audience kind of gasped and laughed, like this dude's written like hundreds and hundreds of books, you know. But Bart himself, Bart didn't even hesitate. He said, oh yes, I can do that. He said, I would do it in the words of a song my mother taught me when I was a child. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so the point is this, right? The most seemingly complicated truth Volumes and volumes of systematic theology can be summarized by the simplest of phrases. Just as the incredible, awe-inspiring, universe-sized majesty of God can be magnified by the tiniest of mouths singing the most elementary praises of our God. We're going to see that in a few weeks when we get to VBS. We're all small and weak, every single one of us, compared to the majesty of our creator, right? We might not be babies, right? You're not a baby, but you might feel that kind of powerlessness at various times. And so just before we move on, let's ask this question. What do we do? What do we do when we feel powerless and weak? What do we do when we feel small and insignificant? What do we do when we need a stronghold against the attacks of our enemy who is making us feel insignificant and foolish. 
So my encouragement to you, according from this psalm, is to remember this simple advice. Praise the Lord. Just praise the Lord. We praise the Lord who uses the weak and foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the powerful. We praise the Savior who welcomes the children to himself. That's what he did because he delighted in their uninhibited love. Right? We praise God because he promises us that when we are weak, he is strong. He's stronger than our enemies. He's stronger than our failures. And we praise him ultimately because that's what we were made to do. We see his majesty. We remember his grace. God is in control, so we don't have to be. So as we meditate on God's glory, David keeps looking up. Right? He's looked up and then he's looked kind of down. Now he looks back up again. And what he sees causes him to reflect a little bit on himself and his fellow human beings. Let's keep going in verses 3 and 4, and we're going to see the second point, which is God's majesty in the grace of our humility. God's majesty in the grace of our humility. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. Here's what he says. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? The most basic theological principle of Christianity is this, that there are two types of beings in the universe. There's God and there's everything else. Now, I, I say that's the most basic because God alone is uncreated. God alone is eternal. God alone is all-powerful. Everything else depends on him for his existence. This is, this is where the Bible begins, doesn't it? The very, very first line of Scripture, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, what happened? God created the heavens and the earth, right? So at the very beginning, we see that there's basic fundamental distinction. There's God and everything he made, right? This creation is not as other myths and fables of other religions and stories would have us believe, this creation is not the result of an eternal struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. This creation is a result of a wise and good God making a good world, right? So let me express, let me just summarize all of this in the simplest way possible. There is a God and I'm not him and neither are you. And it's good for us to remember that when we read this psalm. Now, it seems likely, just based on the words that he uses here, that David composed this psalm at night. We can kind of infer that because it says right there, look at verse 3. He says, when I look at the heavens, he says, the work of your fingers, and then what? The moon and the stars, right? So he's looking up, and he sees the moon and the stars. Now, these are the same heavens that, if we recall from verse 1, cannot contain the glory of God. So they are unfathomably large and yet, David writes that God put them in place with his fingers. What an interesting turn of phrase. You ever sat down in the dirt and just, like, written with your finger? Or in the sand if you're at the beach, right? How, do, how hard is that to do? It's effortless, right? Even little children do it. You know, even babies can you know, write with their finger, right? So think about it this way. This universe, this amazingly immense universe that David looks up and he sees, and he sees God putting it into place with virtually no effort at all. It's the work of his fingers. So David looks at all of this, and how does he feel? What's the word, right? The word would be small. He feels small. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? It's not just that David feels small personally, right? just in and of himself, he feels small on behalf of the entire human race, for all of us, right? He's sitting there staring at the moon and stars, and he has this amazing perspective on who he is and who we are as people. A word about perspective. I grew up in um, Middle Tennessee, uh, but, you know, we had family in, uh, in Florida, and so we would pretty regularly travel south from Nashville, which is where I grew up, uh, from through Atlanta on down to, uh, to Florida. And so if you've ever traveled that route, uh, part of southern Tennessee or north Georgia, you may have uh, come across or seen signs for Lookout Mountain and Rock City. Uh, you can, it's hard to miss them. 
And uh, so Lookout Mountain is right on the Tennessee-Georgia border. There's a tourist trap there at Lookout Mountain called Rock City. And uh, it has a, if you go to Rock City, there's a marker there that claims that from that point, you can look out and see seven states. Tennessee and Georgia, certainly, um, Kentucky and Alabama, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Now, I have no idea whether that's actually true or not, um, or whether some dude just made some stuff up and put up a sign so that people would pay money to walk on his land. I don't know. But here's what I do know. I do know this. The view there from that spot is absolutely spectacular. You can see for miles and miles and miles, and it's really, really gorgeous, and it gives you a great perspective at the enormity of what God has done. David looks at this enormous night sky, right? The bright moon, the twinkling stars, and he feels humble. And that's how he should feel. That's how you and I should feel, right? It's part of God's grace to us to look at the size of everything, to look at the size of us, and to be humbled compared to the majesty of God. That's how we should feel. When David looks at the sky, and is humbled by God's grandeur, though, he also continues as he writes to reflect on how God's revelation of what God has told him teaches him something else about himself and other human beings. And that's our third point, right, about human dignity. The third point is God's majesty in the grace of our dignity. God's majesty in the grace of our dignity. We see this in verses 5 through 8. He says, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, um, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him, it says in verse 6, dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet. And then he lists all the things that he's put under our feet. Sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the heavens, all the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, even if they're not fish, anything in the sea, all of it subject to human beings. If the question is, where do we belong in this immense in this immense creation that we feel so small in, where do we belong? Well, the answer is we belong right where God put us. And that is at the very pinnacle of his creation. These verses are David's poetic commentary, if you will, on Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, the creation of man. And the truths about humanity here are pretty incredible. David says we've been given a, a status or a place over the rest of creation. Now, we're not angelic, we're not God-like, at least in terms of our nearness to God's throne, but we are nevertheless, he says, notice what he says, crowned with glory and honor. And that's interesting, because he's just talked about God's glory earlier in verse 1, but again, our glory, the glory that we have, is different than God's glory, kind of like the created order. It's not glory that we have in and of ourselves. It's not intrinsic glory like God's is. It's a reflective glory. So we have this glory as we bear the image of God in his creation. And as we do what God has called us to do, which is to rule over God's creation, exercising dominion. It's how God made the world. Another word for this that you may have heard is stewardship or responsibility. We represent God's good rule to the rest of creation. And what's included in this responsibility? Everything. Actually, it says all things there in verse 6. You put all things under his feet, and then he gives a list. He proceeds to list all the things. But take note of something that's really important. As you read verses 5 and 6, this is really key, lest we think a little bit too much of ourselves at this point. This dominion, this authority, this dignity that we have is only ours because God gave it to us. Pay attention to the subject and the verbs in verses 5 and 6. God made us. God crowned us. God gave us dominion. God put all things under our control. Our dominion is God's work and not ours. Do you see that? Right? We owe our place in creation to God, not to our own power and ingenuity. So we were humble there's a tendency for us to not be humble anymore, but let's, let's just stay humble, even as we see our place in God's creation. What have we done, though? If I could just kind of pause for a second, even step outside of what David writes here for a moment, and just kind of think, though, big picture, 
about what we've done as human beings with this gift of dominion that we've been given, right? I think it's pretty safe to say we screwed it up real bad, right? I, we spoil it with greed, with exploitation, with sin. Now, certainly we can see this in something like environmental damage, which is right up here at the heart of this psalm, right? Caused by human beings trying to exploit natural resources that God made, not for the benefit of others, but for our own wealth and power and glory. But it's not just that. We also see it in, as we build, as we build societies and cultures and governments, we build them up only to see them torn down by avarice and war and tyranny and even something like the creative powers that God gives us, which is also a part of our dominion, right? The ability to write poems or paint art or any of these things that we have, this beautiful creativity, sing. We got it, we've taken them. God has given us these powers, this authority, and we use them to glorify sexuality and vice rather than truth and beauty. <clears throat> Everywhere we look, Every last ounce of our dominion, unfortunately, has been wrecked and tainted by sin. And so I join David in being awed by God's majesty in the grace of our dignity, but I also wonder, brothers and sisters, what do we do with this brokenness? Is there any way to heal our dominion, to fix it, so that we can be who God made us to be? Well, the author of Hebrews wondered the exact same thing, this New Testament book. And the Holy Spirit, as he thought about that, led him here to reflect on Psalm chapter 8 and to see that our only hope to restore the beauty of what God created, both in the natural world and in humanity itself, in us, is to look to the one who brings peace to chaos and reconciliation to brokenness. Here's the final point, and our final point is actually going to come from Hebrews chapter 2. So if you want to turn there really quickly, we can look at it. It's also going to be on the screen. Our final point is this. God's majesty in the grace of his incarnation. God's majesty in the grace of his incarnation. In Hebrews 2, two verses 5 through 9, the author of Hebrews says, It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. Hebrews is talking about the hope for humanity, the hope for all the world to be restored. And he says, it's been testified somewhere, and then he quotes Psalm chapter 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And then the author of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, kind of translates or interprets this text for us in light of Christ. He says, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That is, God's or Christ's glory has not been manifested fully as it will, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And so the incredible thing is that all of this psalm, right, the praises of the children, the humility and dignity of our place in the world, our dominion and stewardship as people, all of it is meaningless without the restoring power of the person and work of the God-man Jesus Christ, right? It is through Jesus that children's praise can be lifted up. It's through Jesus that human dignity is restored. God created the world, all of it, human beings specifically, to reflect his glory for eternity. And so David's poem in Psalm 8 anticipates and foreshadows what God would do when our sin threatened God's glory in creation. God chose to humble himself. God chose to become a little lower than the angels for a time in his incarnation. God chose to display perfect obedience as Jesus Christ, perfect stewardship, even to the point of substitutionary death on the cross, which would eventually lead to his exaltation, and which we know by God's promise will ultimately lead to the restoration of God's glory to human beings and the entire cosmos, which will be rescued by Jesus. 
Jesus received the praise of children, and he manifested the majesty of his heavenly Father. Matthew Henry writes, No name is is so universal, no power and influence so generally felt as those of the Savior of mankind. The greatest favor ever showed to the human race and the greatest honor ever put on human nature were exemplified in the Lord Jesus. And uh, commentator George Robinson said, I love this quote, he said, The one through whom the world was created came to restore the image marred at the fall. He empowers even the weakest, right, the children, the infants, he empowers even the weakest to participate in his redemptive plan. Verses 1 and 9 of Psalm 8 serve not only as bookends for the psalm, but they also anticipate the end of all things when Christ's enemies will be made a footstool for his feet and his name will be majestic through all the earth. Brothers and sisters, for all eternity, we will be singing to Jesus, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. I'd like to read, before we close, I'd like to read in its entirety the the Christ hymn from Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, where Paul kind of reflects so wonderfully on these themes as he talks about how they're fulfilled in Christ. If you want to turn there, you can read with me. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, it says, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I mentioned earlier that my hope for you is that as you reflected on this psalm that you would reflect, your thoughts would be on the majesty and greatness and immensity of our God. And I pray that now, as we consider the cross of Jesus Christ, you would think that same thing. Our God is big and majestic and wonderful. So wonderful that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that he would be worthy to receive the praise and honor and glory and majesty due his name. As we close, we're going to move towards singing a hymn of response to God. I want, to ask you, I want you to ask yourself a question. Right? How do we respond to the revelation of God's majesty? David has extolled the majesty of God, his name. We've seen his majesty displayed in the enormity of creation and in the weakness of a child and the humility of our human beings and even in our dignity that God gave to us as having dominion over his creation. I would offer this, two ways we can respond. We can respond to God's majesty by rejecting it or by recognizing it. We can recognize God's majesty or we can reject God's majesty. When we recognize God's majesty, it leads to rejoicing. If you're here today and you're a, and you're a Christian, you're already a believer, I want you to ask yourself a good question as you sing in just a minute. Is your, is your entire life aligned with the majesty and glory of God? Are you obedient? Are you worshipful? Are you joyful? But when we reject God's majesty, it does lead to recompense. Jesus will not accept anything less than the full glory due his wonderful name. The Bible tells us that when he returns, and he will return, friends, his enemies will be punished forever. So if you're not a Christian, I, I urge you, I beg you to consider Christ the grace of God, the immensity of his majesty, and the beauty of his grace to you. Embrace the love of Jesus and his free gift of eternal life. Embrace it by faith and let Christ be magnified. That's what we're gonna sing in just a minute. Let Christ be magnified in your heart and in your life. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I I pray for myself, And for every single person in this room, for those watching online, wherever they are, I pray you would protect us from too high a view of ourselves and too low a view of your majesty. It is a dangerous, dangerous thing to not recognize 
the majesty and glory of God in Christ. Open our eyes, Lord, physically and spiritually to see you in all of your glory, in all of your beauty as the majestic creator, as the incarnate son, as the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I pray for those within the sound of my voice who need to repent, repent, Lord, and place their faith in you. I pray, break down the barriers in their own hearts, overwhelm them with your love and mercy. And for your whole church, for all of us, Lord, I pray, I praise you. I thank you for the chance to respond to your grace now and to worship you. So I pray that as we sing, you would fulfill and inhabit our praises, Lord, and satisfy us with your love. We pray that you would be magnified in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.